I'm happy to welcome Alex Dean, who's the co-founder and CEO of Snowplow Analytics in London. And Alex and I met in we person did. about a year ago, last November. It was a pre-pandemic when we were able to shake hands and um, have coffees um, without masks on. So that was Back always, in the day. you know, those, those are the yeah. good times. Back in the day. Um, I saw a t-shirt that said, um, remember the precedented times. Uh, so I thought, you know, that helps me be grateful for, uh, for what we used to have. Um, so Alex, welcome. Um, thanks for joining us and I'm super happy. Thanks to Pete, have great, you. To, great to be here. Very happy to, to be talking to you today. So as is typical, um, Alex, I think you know how we operate uh, DC Thursdays, but um, we do uh, have a live audience. And so we like to open the, the, the wires, if you will, um, for questions from the community. Fantastic. So the community is active and um, might be dropping in with questions for you from time to time. So we'll work those in as we can. That's great. Um, so I definitely wanna, like we have so many interesting things to talk about. Um, the origin story of Snowplow, um, you know, lots of other cool things. But I know that sort of one of the key differentiators and things that Snowplow talks about a lot is this notion of behavioral data. So I wanted to ask you first, just to set the stage for our conversation, um, what, what is behavioral data? What, what do you mean by that um, and, and how to define it exactly? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Pete. And we've, we've done a lot of work recently at Snowplow to kind of get a lot clearer on what behavioral data is and, and start kind of talking much more broadly about it. And it's been really helpful for us to, to, to kind of be clear that Snowplow is all about behavioral data and that's our, that's our big focus. I've got a couple of slides on this. I don't want to kind of, um, you know, I don't want to sort of, drown us in in slideware or anything crazy like that but you know data is a big space we we know that here really well um i think that a, a big point that we stress at snowplow is we're all about the first party data so we're all about the, the data that the companies collect themselves not the kind of third party data that you often add into your warehouse or lake alongside um and then we're kind of clear that within first party data you have a lot of stateful data. So the kind of stuff that you pull out of your CRM or point of sale or ERP system and you use things like Stitch or Fivetran to get that. Um, but you also have this kind of super granular event data, you know, like the, the miniature facts of every single thing that happened. Um, and then within that kind of event data, the thing we focus on is behavior. So predominantly that's kind of customer behavior, it's people behaviors, it's user behaviors. Um, and so that's what we mean when we talk about behavioral data. So, you know, we take the, the, the big broad church of kind of all data, we narrow it down to first party data. Then we look at the kind of event data that's recording kind of the history of everything that's happened. And then we look at this, the stuff within that that relates to behavior and people's behavior. So not for example, um, time series data or IoT data or things like that. We're, we're pretty much focused on the kind of behavior of, of people. Got it. And um, what, what's your origin story through this journey of, um, of the importance of behavioral data? Um, you've been running Snowplow since 2012, and um, I'm sure there's some interesting backstory uh, and, and personal story as to how you actually started to realize this was an important type of data. Yeah, it's a it's um it's a, it's a it's a long old history really. So um so Yali and I started Snowplow as the open source project back in back in 2012. We'd met at an ad tech firm in 2007. We'd left. We'd done consulting in London, and we'd been doing a lot of analytics projects. And kind of what we realized was that our clients had great kind of stateful data. Great, you know, they could give us great extracts from their point of sale and 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 all those kinds of databases. But when it came to the kind of behavioral data. Back then it was often called clickstream data. Um, but when it came to that, they didn't really have anything. So they'd give us like a login to Google Analytics and say, go in there and get what you need. But that's not what we wanted. We wanted like you know, every single page view, every single button click, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so that was kind of how we started it. We, we sort of knew how to build those pipelines. Um, and, and the original thought was, well, why don't we build it again? And this time we'll, we'll open source it. So we'll give it away and say, look, you don't have to you know, be a, be a hot startup with a bunch of data engineers in Silicon Valley to, to have this behavioral data yourself and, you know, kind of control it and own it. Um, and so, and how was it specifically different than clickstream data? Like what was the, what, what were the limitations of 
what you saw as the, the typical ways to access clickstream data at the time? It's a good question. So it, it was it was more that um, so it was more that kind of in in some ad tech areas and things like that, they people had built these super granular pipelines. But the challenge was that on the kind of analytics side of the fence, there were these packaged analytics tools, and they just did not give you access to the raw to the raw extreme data. And so, kind of the, the innovation in a way was saying, oh, well, like we could just we could take those concepts uh, and just you know build them again, open source them, and, and give this kind of engine to everybody um, mm. to to kind of use however they however they apart wanted. apart from the ad tech world. Because the ad yeah. tech was probably the only the only sector that was really talking about clickstream. I mean, I remember hearing about yeah. clickstream beta and ad tech, but that seemed to be, you know, the only sector of the digital economy that was really focused on that. Yeah, I mean, ad tech was was super early adopters of kind of real time architectures um, of kind of store all the things in Hadoop. Mm -hmm. um, so so they were you know a fair few years ahead of the rest of us. Got it. Um, and so. At this time, um, what were the other big analytics tracking systems for web stuff? Was this limited to Google Analytics and Omniture, or were there other, other things in play as well? Yeah, it was folks like that. So um, web analytics is a very mature category. Um, G Google Analytics, GA, we sometimes call it, and, and Omniture now Adobe Analytics with the, with the, the, the big dogs. Um, we, as we were building Snowplow, Mobile analytics started becoming a, a big thing. So, you know, we started to see the rise of things like Kissmetrics and then Mixpanel, um, folks like that. Um, and then kind of, I think that the other way that uh, packaged analytics has evolved since has been with people like Heap and Amplitude. So, you know, packaged analytics tools have continued to evolve. Um, what we've continued to do is kind of give people the, give people the engine, so to speak, the kind of the actual mechanics to, 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 to run this stuff themselves and, and solve their own problems on top of the data. Mm -hmm. And I guess one of the interesting things um, I think about your story that's particularly interesting is that um, you started the company uh, from a consulting shop, if I recall, is that right? You were doing analytics consulting and um, I suppose a decent amount of um, bespoke analytics capture and sort of schema creation for clients. Um, talk to us about that that stage of the, the sort of the pre-stage of the company and how that, that gave birth to the product. Yeah, so that's exactly right. So um, after after Yali and I left OpenX, we did consulting in London. We we ran our own little consultancy called Kepler. And that was how we started to figure out these, these, these problems, these challenges around kind of behavioral data. And so basically we then kind of came up with the idea for Snowplow. We did it in a kind of a slightly uh, eccentric Christmas hackathon style thing. Uh, so kind of came up with the, the, the genesis of that, um, open sourced it, created a new company to, 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 to house um, Snowplow and, and to start developing the, 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 the project and, and the community and kind of went from there. So we essentially wound down the consultancy for a couple of years whilst we were kind of building up the project and started and we were starting to do consulting um, as Snowplow around the project. And so that was that was quite nice because it gave us it gave us a bit longer to kind of figure out project community fit, which is the sort of open source version of, of product market fit. And I think it gave us a little bit longer to figure that stuff out. And um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of great open source data startups today, and they're, they're they're coming out of the stables really quickly. They're raising money really quickly. I think we had a bit of, we were quite early to to look at behavioral data, and so we had a little bit longer to kind of experiment and sort of figure out what this what this project could be. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think you're probably a, a forerunner of um, many of the other companies that we've seen emerge over the last couple of years. I think of um, DBT, who did consulting as Fishtown Analytics. Yeah, um, very true. I think of Superconductive behind Great Expectations that did consulting before they um, birthed their open source project. Um, in your case, would you say that getting open source traction was a key aspect of the early stage of the company or was it was the open source just um did, did it just sort of happen to come along with the fact that you had built this cool tool you were using it in client deployments um so basically you're using it for commercial use and you sort of also wanted to just see what the community thought about it or was the open source adoption like a core part of of your strategy at the time no open source adoption was a really core cool part so our um it turned out that our kind of clients in london weren't quite advanced enough to need Snowplow yet. And so our kind of most exciting early adopters were not 
like or not our consulting clients uh, as um, mm. London. So so yeah, right out the door. So out the door, we got some early pickups. So it was kind of these sort of data mavericks, data MacGyver characters, and they're in a lot of startups and scale ups occasionally inside enterprises as well. And um, like I think we got early adoption inside like Vodafone and Bauer and places. Um, and so they would find Snowplow and they would sort of figure out that it could solve their, their specific problem and, and bring Snowplow in. And, and like, I think in the early days of an open source project, people like that, those kind of mavens are your, they're, they're your oxygen. Like you need those people, you need those people to be really excited about you to kind of keep going and keep building this thing. So, so no, th those early adopters, like, you know, we, we know them all still and, and, you know, we're very grateful to them and, and they were a big part of the story and, and being open source was a big part of the story. So, you know, we, there were all these different um, analytics vendors, package analytics vendors, proprietary vendors being built and continuing to be built. Um, and we knew that the, on the other side of the fence, we knew that enterprises were building these kind of pipelines internally themselves, kind of home brewing them. Um, and so, so the, the fact that Snowplow was open source was the kind of innovation in a way. It wasn't a complete mm. novel architecture, but this thing being out there being Apache 2 license was was kind of was the secret source in a way. Mm. So you you bootstrapped the company for a while through consulting revenues. You launched the open source. You started to see some open source adoption. Um, when did you raise your first round of venture funding? So we only raised that last year, so August 2019. Um, so what did we do kind of in between? So um, we actually moved, we actually brought in a commercial model in 2015. So we'd done kind of consulting until 2015. And in 2015, we, we, we wanted to keep growing, but we, we wanted to stay bootstrapped at that time. So we looked around at different commercial models. And the thing we stumbled on, which was quite interesting, was and we played around with a few different ones. So we tried out Hosted, we tried out a couple of other things. But the thing that people really wanted from us, which is interesting, was they wanted Snowplow. They kind of heard about it. Maybe they'd had, you know, had a friend in another data team who was running it. Um, so they wanted Snowplow. They wanted it inside their own AWS account. So Snowplow runs like natively on AWS and also now on Google Cloud. They wanted it inside their own account, but they didn't know how to run it. And so they would come to us to, 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 to kind of they pay us to run it for them in their own account. And, you know, back then we called that a kind of a managed service. Today we call it private SaaS and it's still the, the, the primary thing people buy from us. And it's and people really like it. They really like the ownership. They like the fact that this behavioral data is theirs and it's inside their own account. But they like the fact that we'll run it for them. Um, so we call that Snowplow Insights. And, and that's what we've been selling since 2015. And, and that's what bootstrapped us up till uh, till we raised money last year. Got it. And did anything change with the company perceptibly once you raised venture? Um, any lessons to other founders out there who might have a choice to either go this bootstrap route or raise money? I mean, from, from my perspective, it seems like every yeah. founder wants to, wants to bootstrap. And in my opinion, many founders bootstrap far too long um, if they have the option to raise venture. Um, but, you know, that's not always the case. I'm curious to, to sort of hear what your um, feedback would be for folks out there who might be thinking about starting something on their own. Yeah, I think I think it's a great I think it's a, such a fun topic. Like um, there's a lot of there's a lot of founders who like bootstrapping. We really enjoyed bootstrapping. I've noticed there's not a lot of founders who bootstrap twice. So like I've noticed there's a lot of founders who the second time around, they're like, OK, I'm just going to raise money and do this thing. Um, but um uh, we'll probably get lots of comments saying, no, no, that's not true. There's loads of like serial bootstrappers. Uh, what do I think? Uh, I think for us, and in a really important part of, of, of the fundraise and then getting the capital to, to deploy into the business was actually about kind of raising our awareness. So, you know, we had, we got the kind of project community fit fairly early, fairly early doors at Snowplow, probably like 2013, 14. And we, we, we started to get this product market fit in sort of 2000 and, 16, 17, but then, you know, it, you know this well, Pete, like in 2018, the whole cloud data market went crazy mm -hmm. um, and just really, really blew up. And, you know, it's very, it's really funny looking back on it because, you know, we've had the snowflake thing and, and all these different events this year, but, you know, it was a lot sleepier a couple of years ago and, and then it started getting big. And so for us, really the, the fundraising and the fact we've been able to be out there much more you know, sponsoring events, like, you know, speeding up our roadmap, all that stuff. It's just helped us a lot with awareness across data teams. Like, you know, for us, the most important thing is that when data teams are trying to solve behavioral data problems, they A, realize that's a class of problem and they B, realize that Snowplow exists and, you know, they can either buy Snowplow Insights or they can just use our open source, but 
you know, every time, every time someone, I find someone who's homebrewed all this stuff in 2020, I'm like, and you haven't heard of Snowplow, I'm like, ah, like that's the problem to solve. So yeah, fundraising has been super helpful on that. Yeah, got it. Well, um, let's get into the, the actual product because I know folks out there are, are curious about, um, you know, insights and um, the way Snowplow works and the architecture and all those things. So um, I, I have to say that I found your website like quite, quite well done. Um, I don't know if, yeah, uh, if, if this is the, the venture capital money at work um, on, <laughs> on, an, on an augmented marketing team, um, but I found that you know, there's lots of info on use cases and um, the products and um, ways to think about data. Um, so yeah, I, I found it super helpful. And I just wanted to call out you know, some of the use cases that you think of in terms of um, top of mind for, for your customers. Um, what, what, like, why do people look for and find a snowplow when there's a plethora of other options? Yeah, and that, that's such a good question. And that's, that's a question we've done a ton of thinking on this year. So, you know, we've had, we've had a lot of adoption over the years, but actually like, getting to the heart of like, why did, like you said, there's all these different things out there. There's lots of package tools. There's lots of like DIY options. Like why do people use Snowplow? And where we kind of, where we've come to on that, and then I think we're super clear on it now, um, is that people come to us because there are use cases they want to solve um, that are kind of part of, powered by the modern data stack they have a behavioral data component. So like, that's why sort of they're knocking on the snowplow door. And, and the really important thing is that they want to kind of build those use cases themselves. So, you know, to give an example, we have a, a lot of customers that, that do um, product analytics with snowplow behavioral data, and there's great like package product analytics tools out there. So why are they using snowplow? And, and it tends to be that there's just something about their product analytics that needs to be bespoke to their business and they can't just use the kind of cookie cutter uh, tools that they that their, their competitors are using and so they sort of figure out that they can use snowplow and so yeah, we started putting a lot of use cases on the sites and we'll add a lot more we've got like a library of 34 of them now um but that i think the key point is you know there's different ones are used by different people marketing attribution is quite hot at the moment um, in this kind of COVID world, like deep subscriber insights and kind of churn reduction is a really hot, hot use case as well. But I think that the, the core thing everyone has in common is people have decided that they want to build these use cases themselves as their own data products, you know, on top of BigQuery or Snowflake or Redshift, or maybe on a data lake or maybe on an event stream. Um, but they want to kind of own that themselves. And, and you know, it's, it's important enough to their business that they want to put their data team, you know, data teams are expensive resources, right? But they want to put their data team on that problem to solve because that is just too important to their business. Um, that's kind of what we figured out this year. But, you know, I think a lot of, um, a lot of te technologies and, and vendors in the data space, I think, I think it's the same for a lot of us, but I think we've done a bit of work on that and we started building out the use cases and stuff like that. So yeah, we're super excited about that side of things. Yeah, it seems to me like as a, as a developer, it seems like one of the um, core differences that you guys offer that's significant is the ability to have bespoke custom schemas and data structures. And where I, as an engineer, I can define um, what the data looks like, you know, that, that snowplow captures, and I can sort of conform that to my own schema, my own desired schema, instead of being at the mercy of whatever schema is delivered to me by some other vendor. Is that a, is that a big selling point? Yeah, it's a big, it's a big part of it. So like when you're working with, um, when you're working with first party data and you're working with the, the, the behavioral data that's being generated off your assets, so your websites, mobile apps, um, you know, sy systems like that, server-side systems as well. Like by definition, you're working with your business entities so you're working with, you know, your definition of the customer or your definition of like a trade or your definition of like a used car for sale. And so, uh, yeah, we, we put kind of schema technology into Snowplow quite like really early doors. I think it was sort of 2004. It was around the same time that um, the, the Confluent guys were getting started with, with Ava and stuff as well. And, and that, that technology is really important because it lets companies express kind of, yeah, their business entities, um, which is really important. And then I would say that, the um the associated uh rise has been on the other end of the pipeline pete where like everyone now is really understanding the importance of working with all that granular data and sort of modeling it up into something that's 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 meaningful for the business and so that's kind of why data modeling is super important analytics engineering has become a big career dbt is like super valuable and 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 so all of this is speaking to like 
yeah, companies want to sort of bespoke model their business end to end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, so on the on the ingest side, um, you have connectors that plug into an assortment of different things to get the data into Snowplow in the first place. Um, are those connectors open sourced or how did you, what, what was your strategy on sort of building those connectors? I'm curious. Yeah, so um, I, I brought up this kind of slightly intimidating <laughs> and noisy technology mm -hmm. diagram in case it's helpful. Uh, but but yeah, no, you're, you're right. So um, we started with, um, so we started with web because that was our kind of our, our home game. That was what we were interested in to start with. So we did web tracking, um, then we got into mobile um, and then we started adding a bunch of server side trackers as well. And we did some other stuff as well, like some third party web hooks from places like Zendesk and, and um, Mail, uh, MailChimp and things like that. But yeah, I mean, we started with web, all, all the SDKs um, are, are uh, open source. I mean, the whole, the whole kind of data transit layer is actually open source. So the whole of this diagram, kind of getting it from the sources, getting it through the processing and then into the warehouse, all of that is, 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 is open source. Um, but, but yeah, the, the trackers are super important. That's where the sort of data starts. Got it. Um, and so how is a behavioral data pipeline different than a regular data pipeline? I think, I think um, you've brought up before that some of your customers run Snowplow in parallel to other ETL systems like Fivetran. Um, why, why does that exist and sort of how do you differentiate um, or how do you think about that? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. So basically the way, the way we think of Snowplow is Snowplow is um, it's a, it's a real-time kind of event-based architecture that's opinionated about behavioral data. So it's got, you know, the, it's got the tracking SDKs, it does like enrichment stuff and schematization stuff in the middle, and then it kind of flows through. Um, so it's, I think there's a few different things to compare it to. So it's not, um, so lots of our customers use Stitch or, or Fivetran alongside. We don't do, um, we don't do ETL. So we don't go and grab, um, you know, the, the, the latest um, customer record out of Salesforce or do like, you know, nightly or hourly syncs into different um, CRM systems or anything like that. So a lot of our customers will use something like that alongside. We don't do change data capture either. So a lot of people might use something like Debezium as well alongside. I guess because Snowplow flows the behavioral data through into the warehouse or the lake, um, people will, you can still, use, you know, you're using the lake or the warehouse as your kind of central repository. And so, you know, if you have other tools that are flowing other data, side piping other things in, that's, that's totally fine as well. So, you know, I mean, there are some sort of philosophical differences, I guess. Some of the ETL tools are more sort of batch based, um, things like that. Um, but I mean, fundamentally, like we're a, we're a real-time pipeline designed for behavioral data. And just for clarity, that also means we kind of sit a level higher than like, a, you know, a Confluent stack or, or, or lenses.io or anything like that, because those are, or, or stream sets, those are general purpose toolkits for building um, real-time pipelines. Whereas we are like, uh, we're more like a platform layer. We're an opinionated layer end to end. You don't have to, you know, to run Snowplow end to end, you don't have to write any code yourself. Mm -hmm. create schemas and things and do some SQL data modeling downstream, but um, it's, we're, not a, we're not a programmer's toolkit. Mm -hmm. Got it. Well, since we have the, the diagram up, um, do you want to walk us through the architecture so that folks have a better understanding of how it works end to end? Sure thing, sure thing. So, um, so yeah, so let's get started. So on the left-hand side, we've got um, our different behavioral data sources that we talked about a little bit earlier. Those all emit um, Snowplow events, kind of raw events into our collector. Uh, from the collector, we hand it over to uh, kind of a processing job. And the processing job does two things. So it does uh, validation of the data um, and then it does enrichment. So the validation is important. So, you know, a way to think of it is these tracking sources are a little bit unreliable. Like you don't necessarily know if your mobile app developer has, has, has um, structured the, the events in the right way. And so the first thing we do is we do validation. So we check that um, the events are conform to the schemas that, that they should should uh, should do. So those schemas all live in a schema registry. They're all JSON schemas. The events that come in are self-describing, which means the event says, I should map on to, you know, um, add to basket version 102 kind of thing. And, and then so I can validate that, that the data is, is correct. Um, and then we, uh, we have a happy path. So the happy path is the data moves on to enrich. And then we have an unhappy path 
uh, where the, the events that fail validation go into bad stream and then they get stored so that you can look at them and, and hopefully recover them if they're, if they're kind of important to the business. Basically recovering them means fixing them and then sending them back into the front of the pipe. Um, after validation, we do enrichment. So basically enrichment is like widening, widening the data. So that's where we add other sort of data sources. So, you know, we do like IP lookups. We can check if um, an event is coming from a bot or a spider. Uh, we can look up the weather. We can pull from um, a database. Um, and the enrichment phase is really interesting because we, we had to build it really early um, in, in the Snowplow history. We started building Snowplow and we didn't have any enrichment. And analysts were coming to us and they were saying, this is great, the data is really granular, but I can't work with it. Like I need to, you know, the first thing I want to do is do like, you know, um, my, my, my website visitors by geo. And we were like, ah, okay. So we just kept adding more enrichments as we went along. So this is where your third party data fits in. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So this is where we kind of pull in like MaxMind and IAB bots and spiders and stuff like that. Um, so then we kind of got a much fatter event. Uh, validate is valid and it's and it's been enriched. It's got more data in it. Um, then we uh, kick it out to uh, a, a good stream. So this will sit um, in in Kinesis uh, for AWS or uh, Google Cloud Pub Sub for, for Google Cloud. Um, and th then we got a good stream. And then from there we sync the good stream into uh, Redshift, Snowflake, and BigQuery are super popular. We can also put it into Elasticsearch. Uh, we can put it into um, S3 and, and Google Cloud Storage as well. Um, so those are kind of the big stores. Uh, and, and then once it's there, once this super granular data is there, then our, our users and our customers work with it. Um, and that's where the data modeling piece comes in. So we um, we did a, we did some really good early work on data modeling um, back in the day. But then we kind of, we spent a lot of time in the last couple of years really focusing on the, the earlier part of the pipeline, doing the port to AWS, from AWS to GCP. But we've come back into data modeling in a big way in the, in the last few months. So we've got, um, we've got a, uh, we created a new official web data model. So it basically takes all the web events and, and basically aggregates them, makes them easier to work with, you know, turns sort of individual heartbeats on a page into kind of page view time and stuff like that. And, so we, we, we're building that out for, for Redshift, BigQuery, and Snowflake. Um, we're also working on a mobile model to do the same the same stuff. At the moment, they're raw SQL, but um, but yeah, we're, we're looking to kind of create some DBT bindings and things like that, just to kind of mm -hmm. um, make make them more more uh, more more broadly useful. Um, so yeah, that's let's, that's kind of the end to end. Let's talk about the the bad stream because I have a feeling that there's some story there where. Um, everybody wants a system to, to operate um, as designed 100% of the time, but you clearly have a, a design path in the system for events that failed validation, I think it says there. Um, how, how do folks use that? And when did it occur to you that it was important to capture those events as well? That's a good question. So it, it occurred to us to do it really, really early doors. So we, We'd been very frustrated with the packaged analytics tools back in back in um, kind of 2010. Around then, we'd been really frustrated that like if if your tracking went wrong, the data just went missing, and we just wasted so much time trying to sort of track down where that stuff had gone and 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 sort of unpiecing that. So it was it was really important to us really early on that this pipeline was kind of unidirectional, that the data was immutable throughout it. And that like bad data wasn't just silently dropped, but it was like, you know, it was always put out to different place. And, you know, I think that, I think that the closest equivalent is, is Unix, right? With like standard in, standard out and standard, uh, like it's just, I think it's very sensible to have a, to have a, a failure path. And, um, um, and yeah, and so the way people use it is um, if, if they've got data that's missing and we're starting to do some alerting in the, in the kind of paid for, Snowplow, but if data is missing, then they'll kind of go in. They'll they'll look at the the failed events. The failed events have like uh, the the reasons why they couldn't be processed. So like you know um, this this add to basket uh, failed validation because it's you know the 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 value of it is a string instead of a number or whatever. Um, so you can see all the failure all the failure messages, and then people people will write like a little lambda function or something like that to to clean it up and get it back into the back into the stream. If it's it. important enough, they might just say, "Okay, that's fine. That was that was testing mode. Let's move on." Sometimes they or, won't recover. Or I suppose they, they could discover ways that their schema um, maybe isn't as tight as they as they thought. Yeah, very so true. It could be sort of iterations iterations over the schema, right, based on what you're seeing in that failed event pile. 
Yeah, and that, that's been a big part of Snowplow. So we did um, we did schema versioning and evolution really early on because we knew that we knew that like people wanted to make changes to schemas to entities, and we knew that people wanted to make breaking changes as well, um, and that all of that needed to happen kind of without the pipeline breaking, without you needing to bring up components, or bring down components, and I think we had to. It's kind of interesting. We had to solve that really early because we were building a you know, a, a general purpose pipeline that lots of different companies mm -hmm. could use. I think a lot of data teams took shortcuts on that stuff because they were just solving this for their company and their entities. So I think, you know, there's a lot of pipelines out, there's a lot of homebrew pipelines out there that have kind of add impression V1, add impression V2 kind of hard, hard baked into them. Mm -hmm. Yep, makes sense. And so this architecture, has this changed significantly over time or how has this evolved? Yeah, it's, it's, it's evolved a fair bit. So um, the original version of Snowplow was uh, pretty much a fully, well, it was a batch architecture. So in the early version of Snowplow, which was AWS only, uh, the collection was like a microservice, HTTP microservice. But then actually the, the validate and enrich was a, um, an elastic MapReduce job. So, a, you know, an Amazon flavored Hadoop job. And our, our customers and users would just um, they just bring up a EMR cluster, do the processing and, and shut it down again, which was kind of a bit slow and clunky, but it was actually really cheap um, because it just was a, um, especially on kind of medium sized volumes and things like that. So, so that was the early architecture. Um, even, even as we were sort of, you know, building that and maintaining that, uh, you know, the whole, the, the, the whole, there was so much innovation going on around real time. So obviously Kafka was, was going great guns. Like Kinesis came out. And so we knew that we, we wanted to replatform and turn it into a kind of a real-time microservices architecture. And, and we did that, um, we did that kind of 2015 to 2018. And when we, interestingly, when we did the Google Cloud port, like we didn't even think about doing anything batch-based. We just built that as like, um, you know, data flow modules and things like that mm -hmm. that just run all the, run all the time. Mm -hmm. Got it. And so, um, uh, can can I see or can we can we see here from this oh, diagram sorry. what yeah. what the difference is between the open source version and and the the commercial version or does the open source consider all these components uh, include all these components it's just more of a managed service yeah it's a great question so this diagram is um is just for now the um uh, the open source um I might have let me see I might have um a different version of this um. Do I have a different version? I don't have a different version of this um, to hand, Pete. But but fundamentally, um, Snowplow Insights, the, the commercial version, there's two there's two extra layers to it. So there's a there's a pretty chunky kind of under the water um, DevOps and data ops layer to to Snowplow Insights. So we do a lot of like automation, monitoring, auto scaling, mm -hmm. all of that kind of stuff. And you know, I think people forget auto scaling is not about kind of bringing the architecture up quickly where well, it's not just that it's also just like bring it down after the big you know black friday traffic spike and all that kind of stuff so so we do a lot of that stuff for, for the customer base um and then the other thing which is which is really fun is we've been building out a, a ui to help um to help our customers with kind of basically work with the behavioral data in their organization some of our customers are in you know very big complex organizations multiple data teams all that kind of stuff um, and so we, we, do it, we do quite a lot there to help them with the, the schemas and kind of creating and evolving the entities. Um, so that's a big part of it. And we're starting to do more now around the kind of the, the data modeling side of it. So like, how do you actually work with this super granular data and, and get it ready for, you know, um, get it ready for a, a DBT or a looker or, or whatever um, off downstream. So, so yeah, that's, that's the UI that we've, we've built on top. And um, uh, and, and yeah, that's that's only for that's proprietary. It's not part of the open source. But the whole data transit layer is is open source. Got it. I see. Um, cool. Well, that's uh, yeah. Thanks for running through that with us. Um, that's really interesting to hear how the architecture has uh, how it works and how it's um, evolved over time. Um, so I guess the other question I had was sort of related to the other competitors. Um, how does Snowplow compare to some of the other um, customer data platforms that are in the space? I think of Segment or um, perhaps in particle or others? It's a great question. And it's a super confusing and crowded market as, as you, as you know, I think that, um, you know, it's a really, it's, it's a complicated market and, you know, customer data platforms 
have been a big, big trend in the last couple of years. And I think there's been a lot of data teams trying to figure out, you know, do they need a CDP? Like maybe their marketing team's been talking to them and like, we need a CDP. And they're like, but haven't we been building all this kind of, you know, data infrastructure ourselves for the last few years? So it's a, it's a really interesting, complicated space. I think that for us, we sort of split the CDPs out in a couple of different ways. So um, I think there's there's clearly CDPs that are doing a lot of work to kind of help activate the, the data and the decisions and, and kind of take all that behavioral data and other like you know, transactional data and stuff and kind of help um, help marketers, help marketing teams, help kind of tech savvy marketing teams to, you know, do identity resolution and then like segment those, those, those visitors and, and customers and then like activate it on different marketing platforms and to be clear we don't we don't do that side of things so you know we're, we're all about kind of getting people the super granular behavioral data getting it into their warehouse and their lake so they can start to solve their use cases and, and they may well not be marketing use cases that they want to solve with snowplow so we see those sort of we see that as one part of the cdp market we see segment and then particle as more like these kind of uh marketing data integrators so they kind of do, they do behavioral data like Snowplow, but they also do like some other stuff, a bit more like Stitch and Fivetran to get other mm. kind of marketing data sources in. And then they do a bit of identity resolution and they do a bit of segmentation and they, they, they're used by marketers as well. So I think kind of, if you squint, like a lot of the same technology is present in a Snowplow as it is in say a segment or an end particle, but we are kind of more focused on the data team and we have a lot of like non-marketing use cases um, whereas I think I think they often are kind of brought in a bit more to kind of do the plumbing and kind of do the connectivity between a lot of different sources, many of which are like marketing sources. So yeah, it's a it's a complicated market. Um, I think for us, like we want to spend a bit more time kind of figuring out how Snowpark can integrate into some of these CDPs so that people can understand you want you want to control your own awesome behavioral data. But then sure, for your marketing team, you do want to let them plug in and self-serve with kind of, you know, segment builders and things like that. Well, do you think um, based on this, this, these distinctions, do you think the buyer is different um, between the, the segment buyer versus the, the snowplow buyer? I mean, it, because you have the open source package and because you are sort of approachable by data engineers and because you can be quickly adopted by somebody without getting, you know, budget, budget authority from above, um, do you find that you sort of grow up through the data infrastructure type team and sort of then bubble up into, you know, paid offerings inside the client? Like, uh, I'm, I'm curious what the customer journey looks like from that respect. Yeah, that's 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 spot on. So we, um, because of the open source and, and because we've been around a, a long time and sort of talking about a lot of the problems that data engineers and, and data teams face, like, you know, data quality and observability and real time and things like that. Yeah, you're right. We, we get sort of picked up and spotted by a lot of kind of data teams. And, um, you know, a lot of those kind of data mavericks and MacGyvers from our early days, they're now um, heads of data. So they're now mm -hmm. head, like, head of data mm -hmm. or head of analytics or head of data engineering or ops. So, so yeah, they, they kind of bring Snowplow in. Whereas I think often the kind of more packaged so, sort of customer data tools. I think they're often kind of more brought in by sort of heads of digital and you know um, commercially mm -hmm. mind, commercially savvy CTOs or technically savvy CMOs, people like that. So that's mm -hmm. my that's my rough read. But I think mm -hmm. you know it's such a it's such a it's such a crazy space and it's growing so fast. I think we see a bit of everything in the in the customer base. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, got it. Well, um, Alex, I know you have some thoughts regarding sort of the modern ecosystem in regards to data lakes, data warehouse, um, and some of these new fangled um, architectures that are being thrown at, at, at us, at teams, um, at businesses. Um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that in general, because you've been in the space for a long time. Um, and I kind of feel like you probably have some things to say regarding data warehouses in the world, um, et cetera. Uh, yeah, look, it's a it's a really fun topic, and uh, we 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 chew the fat on it a, a fair bit. Yali and I talk about it a, quite a lot as well, and I think it's it's fun to have been in the space a, a long time. Um, and I, like we've been in the space a long time. Like um, I um, my first job after uni was doing kind of classic um, data warehousing projects, ETL projects for uh, for, for Deloitte in, in London, like kind of an old school kind of, you know, Kimball star system stuff, stuff. So I've seen, I've seen multiple generations of it. Um, what do I think? I think, I think there's a few interesting things going on. So 
I mean, we talked about how we replatformed Snowplow to real time and that was totally the right thing to do. And we, we, we're a big believer in real time architectures. There's some great real time use cases. But having said that, I think it's interesting how um, how kind of dominant the big cloud data warehouses that are not real time architectures. Uh, it's, 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 it's interesting how sort of dominant they are today. And, you know, I think um, Redshift's maybe handed the baton a bit to, to, to Snowflake, but Snowflake is doing great guns. BigQuery is doing really well. Um, and, you know, like I started, I started hearing from heads of data about 18 months ago who were saying things like we're just, we're kind of ripping out the, the Spark code and some of the kind of, you know, Kafka streams jobs and stuff. And we're just putting it all into Snowflake. It's just, we're just writing a lot of SQL and, you know, kind of putting it on slightly crappy cron jobs and things like that. But like, it was just, it, you know, it wasn't real time, but it was, it was cheap and it was, it was, it was fast. And I think, I think it's, I think it's interesting. If you'd asked me a couple of years ago, I would have said real time would, would, would come along faster. And mm -hmm. um, it's been really interesting seeing kind of the rise and rise of, of the warehouses. I think that um, I, I don't, I don't have a, a horse in the race in on, on, on data lakes and, you know, that they, they attract such strong opinions one way or the other around like, you know, data swamps and schema data versus, you know, uncurated stuff and all that stuff. I do like the Databricks guys seem to be doing really well. Um, we have people talking to us about like asking for like Delta Lake integration for Snowplow and things like that. So I, I suspect they'll end up being like the last, the last big data lake and, 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 and people will continue to love it and use it. Um, I think materialize, they just announced their series B. I think, I think that's super interesting. There's a, there's something missing in our stacks around real time. There's just something missing around kind of easy, low cost development of use cases on top of real time. And we've had like, you know, customers build some really cool use cases using like Lambda functions and DynamoDB and all that kind of stuff. But it's quite, yeah, it's a bit clunky and it's like difficult to do and, and takes time. So I think there's something missing there. Um, but but no, I mean, I think the big, I think the big story is that is, is the big story that everyone knows about, which is just the, you know, the workloads are moving to the cloud data warehouses. And, you know, I think, I think the, the thing I can't figure out, but I'm excited about is how quickly do the data products move there as well? And, you know, how quickly do, do we all start building our, all our use cases inside of, inside of a Snowflake or a, or a BigQuery? But it, that seems to be the trend. That seems to be the direction of travel. Yeah, it makes me wonder how long that will last and, and mm. when we'll regret it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it seems like things move in cycles, right? And when I was yeah. an engineer um, in, in the first internet bubble, um, you know, we were starting to get away from all these triggers inside databases. And yeah, we yeah, still to, procedures. You know, re re remove, remove all of our application logic from inside the database because that was the worst possible thing, um, you know, for it, it was hard to debug and um, it was difficult for, for, for performance and it was just, you know, there were all these sort of concerns about like how that worked. And so we were fighting to decouple the logic like out of the database. And now I feel like we're dangerously close to just shoving it all back in there and call it, you know, just calling it a data lake instead. You're, you're right. And it's so, you're right. It's so cyclical. And you see the same thing with, with business intelligence as well. It's always like, it's always oscillating every few years between kind of self-service and then like it becomes a bit chaotic and like different versions of the KPIs and then everyone centralizes again and then it becomes too service desky and people can't get their metrics and it goes back to, back to self-service. So it's, yeah, we're a very cyclical. Data is a very cyclical industry. I totally agree. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out. Um, well, so on, on the snowplow company building front, um, do you have any, um, any particular things that you wanted to add? Um, I know your team is growing and, um, there's lots of, lots of things going on on that front. I'm curious, um, who you're hiring and what, what types of folks you look for as you continue to build out the, the snowplow team, like who, who's the hardest role to find right now? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, that's a really good question. Um, well, I think... I think in general, there's just um, there's just a shortage of people who've got a lot of experience in in cloud data and in these kinds of architectures. So, you know, we're we're always uh, we're always looking to hire great engineers. Um, you know, our, our our core data engineering is all kind of um, uh, functional programming based Scala, mm. and and those 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 people are really hard to find. Um, our our model is still this kind of private SaaS model, so we we manage a a huge kind of estate of, of, of production snowplows around the world and so we're always looking for great um infrastructure talent that's a 
that's tough as well. But um, yeah, I think I think it's it's it. Everyone, everyone's. You know, we did a webinar the other day, and it was like everyone was hiring at the end of it, and it, it and it's a truism. But I think that, um, but I think also that's kind of why all all us technology vendors exist because nobody has enough data engineers, nobody has enough data mm -hmm. scientists, nobody has enough mm -hmm. analytics engineers. So the more that the more that we can build so that people don't have to, to build this stuff themselves. Like I saw that Fivetran had put out a bunch of DBT models recently. I thought that's really sensible because like now a load of different analytics engineers don't have to write those DBT models. Um, so yeah, we, we're always looking for talent. Um, we, we used to be kind of um, mixed mode with kind of uh, half, the, half the company in London and the other half globally distributed. We still obviously have the London office, but, um, but we're running, we've been running as like a fully remote uh, company for since, uh, since March. So, um, so that's, been, that's been fine for us. And yeah, we, we hire all over the place. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I think it's tough for everyone hiring at the moment. It's just a, it's a crazy market. Yeah, that's funny. So we're, we're talking about data infrastructure companies as a talent arbitrage. Um, they exist, the, the, the plethora of data infrastructure companies exist because it's a talent arbitrage opportunity in the market. Uh, if, if you're able to hire the folks, then, you know, you get to build the stuff. But if you can't, if you can't hire yeah, the data good, engineer, yeah. then, then you're stuck and you're buying stuff from Snowplow. That's a good way. It's a, it's a funny way of looking at it. Um, but yeah, no, it's, um, no, it's good. And uh, um, I think other things, other things that we're looking at, um, so we're just starting to hire analytics engineers, which is super fun. So we've never, um, never had analytics engineers. We had like mm. you know, great engineers who've done that work for us, done mm -hmm. great data modeling, but, uh, but now we're getting dedicated analytics engineers, which is super fun. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, starting to um, think about kind of what our education team looks like. And, um, and I think that's, that's actually probably the, the biggest challenge for us or, or, or I should say the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity. So, you know, we've done we've done some work this summer, this year, figured out the use cases, but actually each of those use cases, it needs quite a lot of material to kind of help people understand how to solve this thing with um, with uh, with Snowplow. So, you know, good uh, one one example. So, like, um, I was just writing like the help desk enablement use case this morning, and if you want to give you know great insights to your uh, support team. Uh, to, to give better support, Snowplow is a good way of doing it. But like, we need to write the blueprint for that. So we need to say to people, hey, the way you do this is you get some product analytics running with Snowplow, then you um, talk to your uh, head of support and you figure out what are the metrics they need, uh, then you model that in DBT, and then you use Census or um, or High Touch to like connect that back out into Zendesk, and you know, and and that's just one use case. So we've got to do a mm -hmm. lot of that stuff to kind of explain explain how to mm -hmm. build all these use cases on top of Snowplow. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, I'm sure there will be folks watching this um, episode and this video who um, will want to reach out to you and um, and mention that they they heard that Snowplow was hiring here. Um, that's obviously one of the big needs of the community, and and we want to serve that need at Data Council is exposing the best companies um, so that they have a chance to to hire from our our community and our audience. Thank so um, yeah, I, I'm I'm glad to hear that the company is growing. And I guess just to, to close things off, um, I'm curious, since I asked this question to most folks, um, what was the thing that surprised you most uh, about building Snowplow? Oh, that's such, that is such a good question. Let me, oh, let me think for a minute. Like what surprised me, what surprised me most? Oh, I don't know, Pete. I think it takes, it takes a long, <laughs> I think I have to say this one, because it's just an observation. It takes a very long time to build like, you know, a, a meaningful piece of technology. Um, and I think that was, you know, we thought we'd be done when Yali and I started to out. We thought we'd do this plumbing thing for six months. We were like, you know, we've got these cool problems we want to solve for our clients. They're missing this behavioral data. Uh, let's just do the plumbing and get back to it. And, you know, that was that we thought that would be six months. That was like mm. seven and a half, seven and a half years ago. Like, mm -hmm. I think actually like building this stuff well and, you know, like really rigorous, like it, it yeah, it's been a big, it's been a big job. So that's been, I think that's been the kind of the, the, the biggest surprise. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think, I think the other surprise is how like effective open source can be as a way of building brand and community. Mm. Like, mm. you know, I think people get confused a bit between, you know, people get confused between open source because it's it has so much in it. So people think about the price point, they think about like 
the fact that code can be audited, they think about community and, you know, there's, there's lots of different dimensions to open source, but when it works really well, you get this great like word of mouth and, you know, people will just, people don't have to learn what it is. They can download it and like poke it with a stick. And that is, that's really valuable. It, it, it creates its own complexities. Like it's, it's, it's complicated to be a commercial open source company um, compared to just, mm. you know, straightforward public SaaS. Um, but, um, but it's, it's, it's pretty awesome when it works. Yeah, that's, that's uh, well said. I, we're seeing that trend a lot in the industry and I think there's so much power be- behind open source and engineers who yeah, definitely. choose to go that route. And um, I know I've been coaching and advising and investing in other open source companies in the data world who, have an unfair advantage in distribution because of those open source bits and the way that they can sort of flow through the, the ether and, and be adopted by teams um, who don't have to worry about the commercial hurdles. Um, yeah, so exactly. there's a lot of power there, I agree. Yeah, um, we actually we actually have a question that came in. Um, so in, in the spirit of um, honoring the, the question from the community, sure uh, someone is asking about the bad data not being yeah. silently dropped. How are clients monitoring those errors inside your failed events? Where do they find errors and how do they send it back to the pipe? Yeah, that's a great, uh, that's a great question. So um, it used to be, it used to be a bit ad hoc, um, but we've, we've built a fair bit of tooling around that now. And we sort of, we just run processes on, on it, looking for patterns, looking for like increases in the number of bad data, new types of error that we haven't seen before. And then we're, we're working on kind of alerting and monitoring to, to tell people about that. And then kind of within, uh, in terms of event recovery, like, again, we're kind of working on tooling to make it easier to, to kind of recover that data and reprocess it. And, you know, it might be really simple. It might be just fix the schema in the registry and run the data through again. Um, but it's, it's one, once you give someone a pipeline that has a bad, you know, a bad path, an unhappy path, and once you sort of explain how that works, people are really interested in that because, you know, people don't want that weird discontinuous drop mm-hmm. in their metrics. Um, some, you know, people are like using this stuff for like, you know, board reporting, for that, you know, public reporting. So, um, mm-hmm. so yeah, like we're, the answer is uh, anomaly detection and we're working on, on more kind of recovery tooling because it is important. Mm-hmm. Got it. Well, Alex, thanks for joining us today. Uh, it was really fun to have you and excited to see the growth of Snowplow. Um, excited to see where the company goes in the future. Thanks so much for having me, Pete. It's been awesome. Yeah, it's been great. So uh, just to close off, um, I wanted to, um, again, thank Alex for for joining us, um, for Snowplow, for being part of our community um, for the last few years. It's been great to have them around. Um, Also, thanks to IBM, who has been our global sponsor for Data Council this year. And um, as many of you have come to learn, IBM is a big supporter of open source. Um, and so we invite you to check out their data science community that has all kinds of online resources and content and training for data scientists. Um, we'll post that link uh, in, in the description um, so that you can quickly access that. Uh, also, don't forget to leave us comments about today's episode in the form. There's a feedback form that we put in the chat so that we make it super easy for you to just uh, pop in and, and drop us a couple of comments. It helps us Um, keep the content fresh, um, keep speakers on that you're interested in, uh, and just improve the overall experience for DC Thursday. So we appreciate you sounding off there. Um, Finally, I wanted to mention that um, in the spirit of helping engineers start companies, um, I'm personally interested in talking to engineers in our community who have the earliest stage um, startups or even ideas before startups. Um, As Alex and I discussed today, there's all kinds of challenges when you start a company as an engineer. And so um, I make myself available through office hours regularly to our community to have conversations with many of you every week regarding um, projects that you have, open source tools, um, or companies that you want to start. And so um, I just want to continue to put myself out there for the benefit of the community and, and, and give back in that way. So please contact me directly if that's something that you're interested in taking advantage of. Um, so finally, if you want to subscribe to YouTube, it's always great. You hear about our future episodes. If you click the bell icon, um, you can set all your notifications to on so that you actually see when we go live with the streams uh, every other week and that you, uh, you don't need to be watching your email. But it's been great to have everybody. Um, thanks again for tuning in. And thanks to Alex. Um, we'll see you all next time.